Good morning, greetings, friends, and welcome to The Bright Side, your nutritional program dedicated to the understanding of the vast world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. I'm your host, pharmacist Ben, nutritional pharmacist from Boulder, Colorado. I use nutritional supplements where other healthcare practitioners use toxic pharmaceutical drugs and sometimes deadly medical procedures. If you suspect that there are natural nutritional roads to your health, and vitality and well-being and to addressing your health challenges, whatever they may be, but you don't know where to begin, you have come to the right place. As you listen to The Bright Side every day, you are more and more in control of your body, you are more and more knowledgeable, and you know you can overcome any health challenge. That is why we are here every day on The Bright Side, helping clear up the sometimes confusing world of nutrition and nutritional supplementation. Over the last 30 years of practicing pharmacy, I've seen drug-free recoveries from diabetes, hypertension, obesity, skin diseases like psoriasis, eczema, rosacea, acne, digestive ailments, autoimmune issues of all kinds, recoveries that by the standards of modern medicine can only be called a miracle. But what is in the world of the body, what is in the world of biology, standard operating procedure because the human biological system is a healing system, it's a regenerating system, it is designed divinely to heal and renew itself on a moment to moment basis and while some folks may call that a miracle, it really is just the way the body works. If you have questions about health or nutrition or prescription drugs, we welcome your phone calls on the bright side. 844-236-6010 is our number. 844-236-6010 is our number on the bright side today and every day. If you have questions about the longevity products, formulations, ingredients, something you may have heard about, read about, questions about skin health, questions about our Truth Skin Health products, and of course, if you have a success story you'd like to share, or if you just want to contribute to the conversation, 844-236-6010 is our number on the bright side. If you want to purchase any of the longevity products you hear advertised or recommended on the program, please head to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can purchase longevity products right off the website. You can also head over to, uh, or you can call 866-735-2470, 866 866- 735-2470. You can purchase products right off the phone or sign up to join the Brightside Ben team right off the phone. 844 or 866-735-2470 is the phone number for the Brightside Ben phone team for a one-time $25 fee. You can start a longevity business and earn thank you checks and help spread the word about how powerful and important a good nutritional supplement program could be. I can help you do that. This radio program can help you. If you're a, a longevity rep, if you're distributing longevity products, use the bright side as a marketing tool. Use the bright side as a way to help market the products, the longevity products, or also to market the business. I personally have been involved with longevity for now almost 20 years since the late 1990s. So call 866-735-2470. They can give you some more information or head over to our websites, brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, and criticalhealthnews.com. Also want to remind you to take a look at brightsidehealth.com. That's my website for various products that, uh, that I find effective and interesting. All the products that you'll see at brightsidehealth.com, including our bone broth protein and our digestive enzymes and, and uh, Bergamax and our coconut powder and vegan protein powder, all, our product, all the products that you find at brightsidehealth.com have been hand-selected by myself. They're, for the most part, unavailable anywhere else, or at least they're hard to find, and they're all effective. I vetted them myself. You can check them out at brightsidehealth.com, and of course, if you want to check out our skin health products, that's truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. If you're dealing with accelerated aging or acne blemishes or dark spots, you want to take a look at our truth retinol 5% gel, also truth serum, truth balm, truth omega-6 healing cream. They'll all help lighten the skin. They're all skin health products. They're not skin care products. They're skin health products. I, I like that term better because it indicates a product that changes the health of the skin, the health of the tissue. That's what real skin care products should be. Skin care should be skin health. In my opinion, you can check out all our truth skin health products at truthtreatments.com, truthtreatments.com. Okay, welcome back to the Bright Side, friends. Continuing on with estrogen as it relates to connective tissue. We've been talking about connective tissue for a long time. Estrogen is your connective tissue uh, hormone. 
for better or worse. We'll talk about that here in a moment. It's been referred to as the female hormone, but it really is much more than a female hormone. We talked about estrogen as a stress hormone. It's linked to immune system issues like multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune diseases, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, hypothyroidism. Estrogens linked to autoimmunity is really behind the gender bias that is well known, well associated with autoimmune disease, autoimmune diseases. 75% of autoimmune patients are women. Autoimmunity represents the fifth leading cause of death among women of reproductive age, and that includes all autoimmune diseases, including, as I say, hypothyroidism. Estrogen is an anti-fertility hormone. It's been linked to spontaneous abortions and miscarriages and problems with fertility. Yesterday, we talked about vitamin E as a anti-estrogen or pro-progesterone substance. Many of the benefits of vitamin E are very similar to the benefits of progesterone. This is why uh, vitamin E is a fertility vitamin. Um, tocopherol, the technical name for vitamin E, means to bear children. Vitamin E is also a blood thinning vitamin, opposing the effects of estrogen, which is a blood clotting vitamin. The, the uh, blood thinning properties of vitamin E are so significant that doctors will often tell their patients not to use vitamin E before they go into surgery because they're just terrified that vitamin E will cause too much thinning of the blood. That's not going to happen, folks. That's not how vitamins work. You could tell your doctor to maybe study vitamins and study nutrition a little bit because nutrition is not drugs. You're not going to overthin your blood by using vitamin E. In fact, you'll accelerate the healing process. In my humble opinion, you want to take vitamin E before surgery. You want to take vitamin E after surgery. There's never a time when you do not want to ingest the mighty 90 essential nutrients. Many physicians are laboring under the, the illusion, the delusion, that somehow vitamins are like drugs, that somehow nutrition is like drugs. That's why they feel comfortable telling their patients not to take nutrition, nutritional supplements before surgery or not to use nutritional supplements if they're on certain prescription drugs. The fact of the matter is, is that vitamins are essential. They're not optional. They're essential. Essential and optional are opposites. Something, that, uh, or something that's essential is non-optional. You can't not take your Mighty 90 essential nutrients and somehow be better off for it. You can't take your Mighty 90, you can't not take your Mighty 90 essential nutrients and somehow be healthier. In fact, using your Mighty 90 essential nutrients with your prescription drugs will most of the time make your drugs work better. Will most of the time allow you to lower your dose on your prescription drugs. Using the B vitamins will allow you to lower your dose on your antihypertensives. Using chromium and vanadium and niacin can allow you to lower your dose of your anti-diabetic drugs. Using essential fatty acids can help you lower your dose on your toxic hormone therapy. Yes, toxic hormone therapy. Toxic. I use that term advisedly because taking exogenous hormones is a toxic protocol, period. And this is what accounts for all the side effects associated with estrogen therapy. Now, progesterone, on the other hand, is non-toxic. Progesterone is a natural hormone, and there's only one progesterone. There's m numerous estrogens. There's only one progesterone. Vitamin E, can be thought of as a progesterone sparing agent. In fact, it's been called a progesterone sparing agent because of its, uh, because so many of its effects resemble those of progesterone. When I was compounding progesterone topically in my compounding pharmacy, I'd always mix it with vitamin E, which number one, supported the effects of the progesterone, and number two, it helped solubilize the progesterone. If you are on progesterone, if you are using progesterone, throw in a little vitamin E, you may be able to lower your dose on the progesterone. So estrogen is pro-inflammatory, vitamin E is anti-inflammatory. Estrogen clots the blood, vitamin E thins the blood. Estrogen is a pro-oxidant, vitamin E is an antioxidant. Estrogen is excitatory, vitamin E is calming. Estrogen promotes heart disease. Vitamin E is protective against heart disease. In fact, vitamin E was first discovered as a circulatory nutrient. This was one of the early benefits associated with vitamin E and improved circulation. Today, we know it's a wonderful cardiovascular drug. Estrogen's anti-fertility. Vitamin E is, uh, supports fertility. It's pro-fertility. He's trying to see a trend here. Vitamin E opposes the effects of estrogen. Vitamin E supports the effects of progesterone. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll take a quick break and come back with more good health information on the bright side. Okay, welcome. 
Welcome back to The Bright Side. Pharmacist Ben here. Thanks for joining us. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 Central Time, and 24-7 on our archive pages, brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. Both have search engines if you miss a program or if you want to review a program. BenFuchsArchives.com. Thank you to Peter in the UK for setting that one up. And BrightsideBen.com. You can purchase Longevity products off BrightsideBen.com, CriticalHealthNews.com, and PharmacistBen.com. And if you want to make some money and start yourself a business, if you're an entrepreneur or entrepreneurially minded, if you're a business person and want to start a business with a little inventory and little infrastructure, just a one-time $25 fee, please head over to brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. You can sign up right off the websites, or you can call the phone team at 866-735-2470. Our number today, 844-236-6010, 844-236-6010. If you have questions about any of the anything we're talking about here today or uh, if you want to wean yourself off your meds, get on a good nutritional supplement program, comments or success stories you'd like to share, 844-236-6010 is our number today. We'll get your calls here in our next segment. So vitamin E is your progesterone sparing or progesterone mimicking vitamin. All the calming benefits associated with progesterone are also associated with vitamin E. Estrogen, on the other hand, is excitatory. Estrogen is stimulating. Estrogen uh, is in, in, induces fibrosis and blood clots. Estrogen is anti-fertility. Vitamin E is all the opposite. Estrogen, uh, vitamin E is blood thinning. Estro, uh, vitamin E is, is pro-fertility. Vitamin E is anti-fibrosis. Vitamin E is calming. The numerous benefits associated with vitamin E, and that includes the cardiovascular and circulatory benefits. Vitamin E is a natural cardiovascular vitamin, cardiovascular health protecting vitamin. It's a natural blood thinner. It's relaxing. That also benefits the heart. Vitamin E is also important for brain health. Vitamin E, it, because it helps support the circulatory system, can be helpful to pre- for folks who are interested in preventing dementia or helping relieve some of the symptoms of dementia. It improves blood supply to the brain. Again, these are all pro-progesterone and anti-estrogen benefits. Interestingly, back uh, vitamin E was discovered in the 1920s and 1930s. This created a problem for the drug companies because they were touting vit- uh, estrogen as being a health benefit, as using estrogen as being a health benefit. They were touting the medicinal properties, the health-giving properties, the youth-inducing properties, the tonic uh, tonic effects of estrogen as a drug, but the problem was estrogen was anti-vitamin E, and we knew vitamin E was was health-promoting and health-supporting. So the drug companies had a little problem. They didn't know what to do. They were trying to sell women on the idea that estrogen was a good thing, and here comes vitamin E, and vitamin E is anti-estrogen, and that's a good thing. This was a big problem. Drug companies were, were obsessed with, uh, with using hormones as med- medicines. Hormones were first discovered in the late 1890s, around 1899, actually. Hormones were first discovered, and it was not very long thereafter that drug companies got involved. This was the beginnings, really, of the drug industry. Actually, the drug industry began somewhere around the 1860s. And by the 1890s, they were on the hunt. They, were, they had the idea, the brilliant idea, that they could make a lot of money with drugs and that drugs were somehow, uh, pharmacology was somehow going to revolutionize medicine. This was the early days of marketing, the early days of Edward Bernays, uh, Sigmund Freud's cousin, who is considered to be the, uh, the father of public relations. Edward Bernays was the first guy to use focus groups and to use celebrity endorsements and models to promote, to, uh, uh, promote goods, tobacco and bacon. Uh, to, even today, we still use some of Edward Bernays's, uh, Edward Bernays's techniques. If you've ever heard commercials where they talk about nine out of ten doctors suggest and recommend, this was Edward Bernays's idea to use doctors and to use medical professionals and authorities and uh, credentialed celebrities uh, to, promote their, to promote their wares. Well, anyway, by the 1920s, when vitamins were, started to, when vitamins were discovered and vitamin E was discovered and hormones were discovered, the drug companies started to get involved in more marketing their wares. They started calling estrogen the female hormone, even though it was well known that men make estrogen, even though uh, it was well known that estrogen had lots of other effects on the body. 
they started referring to estrogen, the drug companies did, as the female hormone. Estrogen was first isolated as an individual substance in the 1920s and around 1929, and pretty soon commercial preparations of estrogen sh started showing up. The first one was something called Eminin, came out in 1930. Later on, more, more uh, estrogen drugs, I guess you'd say, estrogen pharm pharmaceutical agents were released, and they were all promoted as youth pills that could delay the onset of menopause. At the time, menopause was actually considered to be a deficiency disease. And this was the thinking of mainstream medicine. Actually, it was the thinking of mainstream medicine since the 1600s. Menopause was associated with witchcraft. By the 1800s, doctors were looking for a cure for menopause. And the medical model had moved from associating menopause with witchcraft to calling menopause a disease that required, a, a mental disease that required institutionalization in mental asylums. The first obstetrician, the first gynecologist was a guy named Lawson Tate. He was considered to be a, a medical genius. And uh, he thought that menopause was a hysteria type of disease. It was a mental crisis, a mental disorder. He considered to be a sign of non-compliance in women. Women were supposed to be compliant. They couldn't smoke. They couldn't drink. They couldn't vote. They were just supposed to be in the home. In fact, uh, Lawson Tate said that uh, if women were enjoying a glass of wine on occasion, that was a sign that they were starting to become delirious. He suggested they belonged, menopausal women belonged in a psychiatric ward. In fact, that was his remedy of choice. Laxatives and uh, removal from the home at frequent intervals. That was, his, that was uh, at Lawson Tate, the first gynecologist. That was his, for his remedy for menopause. Laxatives and removal from the home at frequent intervals. Commitment into asylum as a treatment for menopausal dementia, quote, dementia. When institutions failed or institutionalization failed and surgery failed, there was always pharmacology, of course. This was the early days of drug therapy. So the first thing they thought of, or, or one of the things they thought of for treating menopause was drugs. The first pharmaceutical had been invented in the 1860s by uh, the early, by the late 1900s and the early, uh, uh, sorry, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there were various patent medications that were being suggested for hot flashes, moodiness, vaginal dryness. The Bible of Drugs is the Merck Manual. This was first published in 1899, and they had various treatments for menopausal dementia. This is what it was called, or actually it was called climacteric insanity. That was the technical name for menopause, climacteric insanity. So in the, if you look at the old Merck Manual from the late 1900s, late 19th 19th century, you'll see things like uh, powdered glands, powdered ovaries and testicles being recommended for menopause, wine, opium, even marijuana. The Merck Manual recommended marijuana as a treatment for menopausal symptoms. So by the early 1900s, hormones had been discovered and they started shortly thereafter, they were started, uh, uh, drug companies started to explore the idea of using hormones as therapy. This was kind of a radical idea that you could actually take a pill and you could stimulate your hormones. Today, we take for granted you could just take hormone pills, but back in the early 1900s, this was a kind of a crazy radical idea that you could actually have an, a hormone pill. The first preparation of estrogen to be sold on the open market, as I say, was a drug called Eminin. It came from placentas, and it was used to treat, first it was used to treat PMS issues, menstrual problems, and shortly thereafter, it was marketed as the first female oral sex hormone. You could actually take a pill and you could support your hormones. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll continue talking estrogen and estrogen replacement and um, nutrients that you could use if you're on estrogen replacement in the coming days on the bright side. When we come back, we'll get your phone calls. 844-236-6010 is our number. Okay, we are back on the bright side. Thanks for joining us, friends. We're on the air Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 Pacific, 10 to 11 Central Time, 24-7 on our archive pages at brightsideben.com. Also, uh, pharmacistben.com. And criticalhealthnews.com, actually, our archive page is at brightsideben.com and benfuchsarchives.com. If you want to purchase longevity products, you can purchase them off of brightsideben.com, pharmacistben.com, or criticalhealthnews.com. And if you want to purchase any of our Truth Skin Health products, go to truthtreatments.com. And if you're looking for bone broth protein, Bergamax, if you're dealing with uh, fatty liver disease, head to brightsidehealth.com, brightsidehealth.com. Our number today, 844-236-6010, and we do have lines open for you. We'll get your calls here momentarily, so hang on if you're on hold. 
a couple interesting stories from Tel Aviv University, published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. Insulin resistance may lead to faster cognitive decline. Insulin resistance, i.e. type 2 diabetes, is associated with cognitive decline. Insulin resistance is associated with damage to the circulatory system, damage to blood vessels. This impairs blood ve uh, circulation to the brain, impairs oxygen delivery and nutrient delivery to the brain. And as I've said so many times in this program, Alzheimer's disease is a form of diabetes and type 3 diabetes. Remember, all diseases are the two, the, the three points in the triangle of disease lead to all chronic long-term degenerative diseases. You don't need to have to wait for the medical model to authorize Alzheimer's disease or cognitive decline or dementia as a blood sugar problem. You can pretty much rest assured that if it's a chronic long-term progressive health issue in the brain or anywhere else, you're dealing with at least partially insulin resistance and it doesn't matter if you've been diagnosed as non-diabetic it doesn't matter if the doctor said oh you're not a diabetic we tested your blood it doesn't matter diabetes is an arbitrary diagnosis and distinction based on arbitrary test measurements go by your symptoms if you're dealing with an inflammatory long-term chronic progressive health issue almost by definition you are dealing with insulin resistance period this is a study from uh, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, quote, this study lends support for more research to test the cognitive benefits of interventions such as exercise, diet, and medications that improve insulin resistance to in order to prevent dementia, says Professor Tan, author of the study. Of course, he had to throw in medications because he's a doctor. I say, forget the medication, work with your diet, work with exercise, stabilize your blood sugar, and lay off the foods that spike your insulin. Here's another interesting one. This is from the American College of Cardiology's 66th annual scientific session. Lifestyle intervention leads to a 10-point drop in blood pressure. Surprise, surprise, where have you heard that before? If you are on a antihypertensive drug, practice deep breathing techniques, use hot water, use relax, progressive muscle relaxation, anything you can do to relax the body. And that includes reducing your intake of insulin spiking foods, which have a stimulatory effect on the body. Anything you can do to relax the body, any lifestyle intervention strategies you can use for relaxation will lower your blood pressure. If you don't believe me, just draw yourself a hot bath. Take your blood pressure before you get into the tub and then take a bath for 10 minutes and then take your blood pressure again and watch what happens. It's as simple as that, folks. Take two baths a day. Not only will you be lowering your blood pressure, but you'll be adding years to your life and fighting cancer and improving your skin health too because you'll be activating the parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system. Simply a simple hot bath, simple hot tub. Eight four four two three six sixty ten is our number. Keith has been holding on for a long time. Good morning, Keith. Thanks for waiting. How's it going, buddy? Oh, it's going real good, Ben. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. How can we help you today? Yeah, but I have a couple questions. The first one is, is it true that your first morning urine pH should be between like 6.4 and 7.2? And if it's not then your body's going to be drawing minerals from your bones to buffer your pH to get it to that? Well, you know, that's an interesting take. First of all, the acidity, uh, the acidity of your, uh, or the acid level of your urine, pH, i.e., um, it has to do with how fast cells are dying, how toxic you are. And so this whole idea of alkalinizing your, your, uh, your blood and, and alkalinizing your urine and alkalinizing your system is kind of misleading because it implies that all you got to do is eat alkaline foods and somehow or another the pH of your blood will go up. That's not the case. If you're toxic and cells are dying, acidity is a measurement of bodily toxicity. That's the problem with acidity. Now, acidity is, acid is a measurement of toxin. Yes, to answer your question, by the way, morning pH, uh, morning urinary pH should be somewhere between 6.5 and 7.5. I think that's, what did you say? Uh, 6.4 to 7.2. Yeah, a little high. 6.5 to 7.5 is typically okay. where you want to be. If it's too acidic, that's a sign that your body's breaking down. When a cell dies, it spews out its contents. This is where inflammation begins. 
chronic inflammation begins is when cells die. When, they, when a cell dies, it spews out its contents, which tend to be acidic. So when you're acidic, that's a sign that cells are dying. That's a, cell, that's a sign that your body is breaking down. And you don't want to necessarily alkalinize your body by taking, by taking alkaline substances. What you want to do is figure out why cells are dying. Why is your body breaking down? That's the way you take care of acidity uh, and alkalinize. And by the way, the way nature intended us to alkalinize is with oxygen. Oxygen is alkaline. It's not foods. By the time a food leaves your digestive system, by the time food gets broken down in the stomach, it's not acid. It's acidic. It's no longer, it's no longer alkaline because acid has acted upon it, if you're healthy anyway. Acid has acted upon it in the stomach, and it leaves the stomach as an acid mass called chyme. So even if it's an alkaline food, it's going to leave the stomach as an acid mass. So eating your way to alkalinity is pretty nonsensical from a biochemistry point of view. If you are acidic, you want to relax your body, breathe, make sure you're oxygenating, and figure out where the damage is coming from, which is usually food and blood sugar, and then correct it at that level. I'm sorry, I hope I, answer, I, hope I was but answering your question. But it also come from, a, if you have, a, say if you had your like wisdom teeth pulled, and so you have uh, like an infection and you're, you're yeah. not even aware of it. Could that yeah. uh, affect yes. the pH also? Absolutely. Anything that breaks the body down will drop the pH. Anything okay. that breaks the body down that causes destruction of cells will drop the pH. And by the way, you want your skin pH to be acid. You want the inside of your body to be alkaline. And that's where this whole idea of alkaline or uh, alkalinize or dye comes from. The outside of your body, however, the skin has to be acidic. What was your second question, Keith? Second question, which you probably pretty much answered. I wanted to ask you about these water filtration systems, one called an alkaline water ionizer, what your take is. Again, on. you know, once it, the water leaves your stomach, it's going to be acidic. It's going to be acid. Right. Okay. So, you know, that's ingesting substances to raise your pH, to go alkaline. It doesn't make much sense to me. If anybody out there can explain to me how that would work, I'd like, love to hear because it, it just doesn't make sense because your stomach acidifies everything. You know, see what I'm right. saying? Now, if you have minerals, minerals have an alkalinizing effect. So minerals can, can have an alkalinizing property. If you take straight minerals, they'll leave the digest. But I don't even know if that's the case. I'd have to look that up. In any case, the, the way you want to alkalinize is with oxygen and also to eliminate cell destruction or minimize cell destruction if there's any long-term chronic inflammatory issues going on. That's usually why cells die. I could have had hey. something like that because I wanted to let you know also, by the grace of God, that I spoke to you uh, quite some time ago and you changed my health around. I used to have an oh. auto, autoimmune problem. Oh, I want to hear. Hey, hey uh, can you hold on through the break, Keith? I want to hear about that when we come back. Yeah, we sure. got to take a commercial. Hang on. All right, I'm Pharmacist Ben. You're listening to The Bright Side on the Genesis Communication Network. We'll be back right after this. Okay, we are back on The Bright Side. 844-236-6010 is our number. We're talking to Keith in New Jersey. So uh, before we went to break, Keith, you were talking about autoimmunity. Uh, continue. I want to hear what, uh, yes, about what you came up with. About 12 years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition after experiencing uh, weakness and atrophy taking place in my one leg and both of my hands. So I went to probably about 12, 13 different specialists trying to find out what was causing it. And finally, the one specialist said he didn't know what was causing it, as they all said. So he started putting me on an immunoglobulin, which okay. pretty much took care of the symptoms for a while. But then it came back again where I started losing more atrophy again and more weakness. And then I heard about your program through a religious show uh, that Dr. Wallach was on there. So I got in touch with you. And I hooked up with one of your reps, uh, Cosmo, who put me in touch with uh, you. Okay. And right away, you had told me what basically what it was, a digestive problem, or it could be dirty blood. And you gave me um, a bunch of things that I should try. And after uh, being on the supplements and doing, like, the deep breathing, bone soups, etc., probably after about two months, I started noticing a big difference in my... How do you uh, like that? ability to walk and it's like the atrophy was going away the uh, the numbness that i was experiencing was going away that's awesome and i continued on it eventually i got off of the immunoglobulin that's awesome. i was getting treatments on that two days every four weeks for about five six hours per day oh my god and it just i just it's just a, a completely 
just feels great now where I'm at. Oh, that's awesome. Great story. Thank you for sharing, Keith, buddy. Have a beautiful day, man. I hope we helped you Thank out, you okay? Thanks All right. Take, take, care. take care, man. All right. I love hearing stories like that. All right. 844-236-6010 is our number. Good morning, Rick in Michigan. Welcome mm-hmm. to the Bright Side, buddy. Thanks, uh, Farmer Ben. Big fan. Thank you. What's going on? How can anyway, we help you? I have a I have a question that very, very few health experts talk about, but I'm confident you will know <laughs> you'll you'll be able to share with us. And that is okay. the components of vitamin E. I've been, you know, I don't know about brainwash, but really read a lot that uh, tocotrienols are a vastly superior element versus tocopherol. Yeah. Please explain a, that to all your Okay, friends. that's that's good. Okay, and uh, that's something we're going to talk about, probably end up talking about here next week. There's eight different forms of vitamin E in what is called the vitamin E complex. Fatty vitamins, unlike water-soluble vitamins, come in a complex. There's various forms of them. There's various forms of vitamin K. There's various forms of vitamin D. There's various forms of vitamin A. But none have the same kind of complexity that the vitamin E molecule has or vitamin E complex has, I guess you would call it. Yeah. It's made up of eight different components. Four are called tocopherols. Another four are called tocotrienols. And it's true in terms of antioxidation and cardio protection, which is really vitamin E's claim to fame is its benefits for the heart. Tocotrienols are superior. However, in my opinion, you want to do everything. And that's why I like people to look for mixed tocopherols and mixed tocotrienols. Your, your, the uh, standard form of vitamin E is called alpha tocopherol. It's one of the tocopherols. If you take mixed tocopherols, you'll get all four tocopherols. If you take mixed tocotrienols, you'll get all four tocotrienols. The best way, if you want to do it completely, is to take mixed t- tocopherols and mixed tocotrienols, which is what I do. Tocotrienols are significantly more expensive, though, than the tocopherols, but yes, I tend to agree. Uh, they're probably a little bit more potent, a little bit more beneficial, certainly in terms of their cardioprotective benefits, uh, the tocotrienols, which we really haven't known about for maybe maybe about 20 years or so, um, is all that we've really, I think maybe a little earlier than that, maybe the 1990s somewhere, they started to discover these tocotrienols and started to work with them. In any case, your point is well taken. The tocotrienols are probably a little bit more effective, although they are more expensive. Does that answer your question? Thank you so much for confirming that to us, uh, uh, Ben. I knew you would. I knew you wouldn't disappoint. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rick. Take care, man. Have a beautiful yep. day, buddy. Bye, bye. Okay, bye, bye. Yep. Thanks. Appreciate the confidence there. Uh, let's go. Let's stay in Colorado here and talk to Jim. Good morning, Jim. How you doing, buddy? Jim, I think we had Jim. We had this problem with Jim yesterday. Jim, Jim, Jim. Yeah, I know. For some reason, we can't get through to Jim. I don't know what's going on, Jim. Uh, you're connected here. I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you. So I'm going to put you back on hold, buddy, and then uh, we'll get you after we take this other call. I don't know what's wrong with Jim's phone or if it's us. Uh, Mara. Mara. I'm not yes. sure where Mara's uh-huh. going. Hi, Do Mara. You have com- Hi, Ben. Do you have com- We appreciate your knowledge. Do you Thank have you. confidence in a hydrogen peroxide therapy? I have read about. I've what read about it, too. 30- what do Go you ahead. think about it? Uh, you know, I've read a lot of good stuff about it. I don't have any personal experience with it. Um, uh-huh. Again, like I was talking about earlier, I'm not sure how you can ingest a peroxide uh, and get any oxygen benefits from it uh, through the digestive tract, but I do know that there's a lot of people who swear by it. I have not had any personal experience with it, but I have read the same things you've read about it. I know you can oh. use hydrogen peroxide as a tooth whitener, and you can use yeah. uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide in the, uh, in the mouth. It will help yeah. kill bacteria. But as far as right. drinking, drinking hydrogen peroxide in water and then somehow upregulating or increasing your own oxygen, I'd, I just don't uh-huh. see a mechanism for it, although I, I've read right? the same... Yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to say yay or nay, but from a biochemical yeah. perspective, I just don't know how anything can leave the digestive tract intact. Mm-hmm. How can that oxygen leave the digestive tract as oxygen, and how can, uh, how can uh, alkaline or acid, or alkaline substances leave the digestive tra- tract as alkaline? Perhaps it can be done, and I've read, like I said, I've read the same things you've had. I just don't see a mechanism for it. That's just my I opinion. Thought- 
I thought it goes into the bloodstream fast. I, I don't know how that. it would. Yeah, I mean, I food see. goes in. Okay. So think about what happens when you eat a substance, when you ingest a substance. It goes down your right. esophagus. It takes, By the way, it takes about seven seconds to, to get from your mouth to your stomach. It goes into the stomach. Yeah. The stomach acidifies it, leaves the stomach as an acid mass, enters into the intestine. At that point, how can hydrogen peroxide still be hydrogen peroxide after it's mm. been reacted with by enzymes and acid in the stomach? Maybe it can. Yeah. I mean, like, I've read the same things you've read, and, and they say that. You know, it, I've never really read any scientific stuff about it. Although I have read about injecting hydrogen peroxide, and that's a little bit different because then it's not going to be subject to digestive juices and digestive substances. But that's not, mm -hmm. injecting is different than oral ingestion. Yeah, I see what you mean. Um, well, then how would you recommend you breathe. talk today about increasing oxygen? How breathe. would you increase oxygen? Just breathe. Breathe. Okay, good breathing, breathing, breathing. That's how God intended okay. oxygen to get in the body is through the breath. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Bless you, Ben. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh -huh. that, that's why breathing is such among, this is why breathing has such a powerful relaxing effect on the body. Oxygen is relaxing to a certain extent. And by the way, carbon dioxide, which opposes oxygen, is also important because under conditions of enough carbon dioxide, the body will suck up oxygen more readily. So carbon dioxide actually acts as an oxygen magnet. So don't underestimate the importance of carbon dioxide, which is why I always say exhalation is where the relaxation comes in. Oxygen is actually very stimulating to the body, uh, but on the exhalation, when you're blowing off oxygen and your carbon dioxide levels are becoming relatively high, Higher, that's when the body relaxes. Nonetheless, under conditions of oxygen deficiencies, all kinds of health challenges can ensue because oxygen is such a vital, vital fuel for cells. Uh, and that includes cancer, by the way. Cancer, is, uh, cancer induction is well known to be associated with hypoxia or low levels of oxygen. Low levels of oxygen are associated with all kinds of health challenges, and that's why practicing slow, deep breathing, both focusing on both the inhalation and the exhalation, exhaling a little bit more than you inhale is so powerful when it comes to lowering blood pressure, reducing stress, relaxing the muscles, increasing the content, increasing the levels of relaxation neurotransmitters like serotonin, brain chemicals, all kinds of health benefits from something as simple as deep breathing. If you don't want to take the time to deep breathe, that's where a hot bath and a hot shower come in. You will automatically find yourself breathing more deeply when you're in hot water, when you're in a hot bath. That might be why hot water has so, so, uh, such m remarkable relaxation benefits. It may be by its ability to increase oxygenation to tissues via blood vessel opening or so-called vasodilation, which is induced by hot water. Cold water, on the other hand, will do the opposite. Cold water is very stimulating. Cold water, uh, sp uh, throwing cold water in your face is a, a great way to wake up first thing in the morning. Hot water is relaxing. Cold water is very stimulating, and that's true uh, when you drink cold water, too. That's why a lot of folks say you want to drink your water at room temperature because cold water can be so stimulating. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's just the, that's just the logic to that suggestion. Okay, there's the music, and that's the end of our program. Thanks for listening to The Bright Side. Uh, we'll be back at you on Monday, and we'll talk more estrogen more connective tissue and also continue talking about vitamin E and its importance for folks who are dealing with estrogenic health issues and that includes cancer. There's a very important relationship between estrogen and cancer. If you're interested in checking out our true skin health products, including our Truth Retinol 5% Gel, please head over to truthtreatments.com. And of course, I'd love to have you on the Bright Side Ben team. If you want to make some money selling longevity products and help spread the word about the power and importance of a good nutritional supplement program, call 866-735-2470. Tell them you want to join the Bright Side Ben team. Thanks for listening. Have an awesome, wonderful, beautiful day. I'm Pharmacist Ben. We'll talk to you all later. Bye for now.